1977, Frederick Sanger and his team sequenced the genome of the bacteriophage Phi X174. This breakthrough, like so many things in science, came on the back of the great discoveries of the past, like the elucidation of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick in the 1950s. But Sanger also drew upon the technique of autoradiography, which was used in the early part of the 20th century, to place radioactive labels on the nucleotides. And of course, he also used polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. But what was particularly eloquent about the Sanger sequencing technique was the use dideoxynucleotide phosphates. Following Sanger's groundbreaking work, fluorescent markers would be added to this technique and then later capillary electrophoresis would be carried out in the lead-up to the Human Genome Project at the end of the 20th century. But to understand the role of the dideoxynucleotide phosphates, we will take a look at the Sanger sequencing technique and the subsequent advancements from this technique that paved the way for the success of the Human Genome Project at the end of the 20th century. So before I hand you over to the good people at iBiology for a full lecture on the history of gene sequencing, let's go in and take a look. First recall that in in vivo DNA replication in a living system, the enzyme helicase unwinds the double helix, and then a primer is required with replication happening in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The Sanger sequencing technique does not require the use of helicase, and DNA is denatured by the use of heat. But then primers and all of the other components required for DNA replication need to be introduced, including all of the required nucleotide triphosphates. As DNA is assembled, the 5' prime phosphate of one nucleotide plugs in to the 3' prime hydroxyl of another nucleotide by a condensation reaction which leads to the formation of a phosphodiester bond and DNA continues to grow in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. An important component of the Sanger sequencing technique is the use of the dideoxynucleotide. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is built from the 5 carbon sugar deoxyribose, which has already lost one of its hydroxyl groups on carbon 2. The dideoxyribose loses another hydroxyl on carbon 3, and this gives it the formula of C5H10O3. The consequence of this is that once a dideoxynucleotide phosphate is incorporated into a growing DNA strand, it stops further growth of that chain because the required OH group on carbon-3 is no longer present to allow for the plugging in of the 5' prime phosphate of another nucleotide. And in this way, the dideoxynucleotide phosphates were used in the sequencing of DNA. By the time of the Human Genome Project, additional advances allowed for the addition of fluorescent markers to these endpoints of the growing strand. And this, when combined to the technique of capillary electrophoresis, paved the way for the successful sequencing of the human genome at the end of the 20th century. But to put all of this into the proper perspective, I would like you to click here and to go to a full lecture from Jonathan Wiseman at iBiology the first seven minutes are particularly useful for explaining the use of dideoxynucleotide phosphates, but the entire presentation is very good for understanding the nature of science and getting an appreciation of how quickly gene sequencing is advancing in the 21st century.